OK, good afternoon. Um, I am still John Tokar, Chief of the Center for Cryptologic History. Welcome to Session 6B, and 6B's session title is World War II Tactical SIGINT. Um, got a great panel lined up for you this afternoon to close out day one of our symposium. And it's uh, an honor for me to introduce them in order of how they'll speak. First is uh, Major Spencer French, who is a active duty U.S. Army military intelligence officer currently stationed um, at Fort Meade 704th MI Brigade, so just down the road. Uh, he will, uh, as all the speakers will, they'll be um, taking your questions. Uh, their, I'm sorry, their full bios and abstracts are available in the packet that we sent you earlier, and we will be taking questions through the chat um, that you can submit throughout the presentation, and we'll read them to the presenters at the end. Um, his, I'm sorry, Major French's uh, topic is not just lucky how Patton's Third Army adapted to generate operational level intel information advantage from March to August 1944. After him, we'll have Dr. David Hatch, who you've seen uh, earlier today if you were with us. And Dr. Hatch, of course, is the NSA historian and has been with CCH since the early 90s and um, is really a national treasure to us. Um, his topic today will be tactical naval SIGINT in the battle for Iwo Jima. And then after Dave is completed, I'll turn it over to Dr. Samuele F. S. Pardini, who mm -hmm. is the professor of American Studies and Italian Studies at Elon University. And his topic will be Reading Literature, Deciphering History, How a Jewish American Literary Critic Made Sense of World War II and Helped Win It. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to our first speaker, uh, Major Spencer French. Take it away, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. It's really a, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, speak to you about this uh, really fascinating topic about uh, one of the truly iconic uh, innovators um, in this space. So. Uh, in late July uh, 1944, with the Allied forces bogged down in the Norman hedgerows, Berlin and victory seemed nowhere out of sight. Now, Lieutenant General George S. Patton Jr.'s Third Army was earmarked as an exploitation force tasked with the seizure of the port of Brest. Allied planners intended the supplies flowing through Brest to fuel a long systemic campaign across France, which, even if it all went well, was forecasted to take at least another year to reach the German border. Yet less than a month later, Third Army was on Germany's doorstep. Over 500,000 German troops were killed, wounded, missing, or captured, and the vast majority of German war material in France was in Allied hands. From the moment it became operational on 1 August 1944 until it reached the Moselle River in September, Third Army is always one step ahead of the Germans. Despite the challenges posed by immature technology, a new and challenging operational environment, and a peer enemy, Patton found a way to generate advantage. Slide, please. Patton was a true icon of innovation. and He derived his success in large-scale combat operations on the continent from his dynamic and innovative approach to warfare and his special units, purpose-built to aid Third Army in managing information. Specifically, Patton strove to generate what 21st century U.S. concepts define as information advantage, a condition when a force holds the initiative in terms of relevant actor behavior, situational understanding, and decision-making. Patton sought to seize the initiative continually take his first at his following action before the enemy could react to his last. Rapid exploitation disintegrated the enemy in depth, while speed compensated for security, allowing Patton to economize his force and concentrate combat power. Generating this information advantage over German forces allowed Third Army to gain and maintain the initiative, manage prudent risk, anticipate decisions, and extend its operational reach throughout the pursuit across France. Slide, please. Patton's information approach uh, and decision-making set him apart from his peers in contemporary U.S. Army doctrine. Throughout the conflict, the U.S. doctrine placed most of its emphasis on the massing of firepower and exploration of how to enhance friendly decision-making and disrupt enemy decision-making was somewhat limited. As early as 1943, Patton developed a concept for leveraging information to first gain and then maintain the initiative. He viewed intelligence as providing an initial advantage to 
do it first, uh, gain the initiative and pursue operational level maneuver. Similarly, he saw that he could rock the enemy back on his heels by attacking enemy cognitive processes. By denying the enemy information, providing false information, or reducing the enemy's time to make decisions, he could get inside the enemy's decision-making cycle. Patton's G2, or intelligence officer, Colonel Oscar Koch, described Patton's formula as following up his first action by a second in less than the minimum time necessary for the enemy to react. Patton recognized that if he could maintain the speed and accuracy of decision-making while injecting friction, delays, or indecision into enemy decision-making, he could maintain the initiative indefinitely. To prevent the enemy from getting his balance, Patton sought to protect his information and, and his advantage in situational awareness. He viewed communication security as critical to protecting free information and the rapid transmission of friendly information as the key to maintaining common situational understanding. Yet information was only as valuable if, if one possessed the time to orient oneself, decide, and act upon the information gained. Likewise, Patton's pursuit of on pers his emphasis on pursuit reflects his understanding of how information could be employed to disintegrate enemy formations, allowing his forces to, quote, mop them up. Thus, Patton possessed a clear, cohesive, and comprehensive vision of achieving specific effects on friendly and enemy decision making. Intelligence combined with superior situational understanding and assured decision making processes would allow him to make the first move and dictate the campaign's tempo, while attacking enemy information and decision making could disrupt and delay them. Speed here was the key. Slide, please. To operationalize his information advantage approach, Patton and the Third Army staff built dedicated information forces during the spring and summer of 1944. The Army Information Service, or AIS, and the Signal Intelligence Service, the SIS. The SIS and Third Army is led by Major Charles Flint and organized under the Signal Section in close coordination with the G2. Doctrinally, the CIS was responsible for signals intelligence activities, signal security, and the preparation of cryptographic equipment for the Army. The CIS exercised technical control over the Army Level 118th Radio Intelligence Company and four core level signal service companies. These companies conducted signals intelligence collection and production, friendly signal security monitoring, and direction finding. Together, the CIS enterprise protected friendly information through security monitoring and distribution of cryptologic cryptographic materials. It also enabled decision making through the provision of combat intelligence information and intelligence. Yet in the run up to the invasion of Fortress Europe, Patton integrated additional functions under the SIS to support his information advantage approach. Patton charged the CIS with managing all radio countermeasures for Third Army. This included disrupting enemy decision-making processes by integrating radio deception under the signal section, uh, radio deception operations, such as opening and closing uh, radio networks to confuse German traffic analysis or providing false information via the radio. It also included responsibility for denying the enemy the use of information through electronic attack what that, or jamming. Uh, integrating these activities under one single executive agent created efficiency, synchronized effects, and supported Patton's information advantage vision, protecting friendly information to prevent the enemy from acting first or regaining the balance. Patton believed that both time and detail were also lost in transmitting messages back to the Army headquarters through normal channels. In fact, the, three, the uh, G3 or operations section uh, estimated that it took about 10 to 12 hours for information from a frontline combat unit to make its way all the way back uh, to the Army level headquarters where Patton could use it. So, in the summer of 1944, he converted the 6th Cavalry Group mechanized into an Army Information Service. The Army Information Service was tasked with enhancing operational level understanding by operating a rapid communications channel, bypassing normal command channels under Army control, direct from frontline units to the Army command post, monitoring friendly battalion, regiment, division, reconnaissance unit radio nets, and running a system of patrols of combat posts and observation posts of battalions and regiments while maintaining periodic contact with the division, intelligence, and operations officers to exchange information. The AIS directly reported in reconnaissance and intelligence information to the G2 and friendly force information to the G3, Colonel Maddox. To accomplish this mission, 6th Cavalry Commander Colonel Edward Joe Fickett created and, retained and retrained nine platoon-sized information detachments for assignment at the division level and four supplementary detachments consisting of troop headquarters for assignment at the core level. The divisional attachments consisted of two officers and 40 enlisted men. 
uh, and were subdivided into a commanded monitoring section that did the, uh, the passive collection of, uh, of and, and retransmitting of, uh, of radio traffic and a patrol and liaison section that went out with combat forces uh, to get their forward line uh, information. Slide please. At the Army level, Fickett established an AIS information center that was co-located with Flint's SIS headquarters and a specially built communications van. Uh, this information hub would process and route signal intercepts and communication security violations to the G2 and signal officer from the 118th RI company and the signal service companies. And it would also process and route combat information and intelligence from the AIS patrols to the G2 and G3. Slide. So, Third Army activated in France on 1 August 1944, and the days that weeks that followed would demonstrate the effectiveness of Patton's information advantage approach and his specially purpose-built information forces. Operation Cobra began on July 25th with the limited objective of breaking through German lines and seizing Kutnall. By 1 August, Middleton's 8th Corps had already taken Kutnall and, and seized Avranche and was heading south. Sensing the opportunity to exploit this breakthrough on the Cotonou Peninsula, Patton decided to push Major General Wade H. Hayslip's 15th Corps and Major General Walton Walker's 20th Corps of 200,000 men and 40,000 vehicles in a column through the narrow corridor at Avranche, which if you look at your map is basically on the western side of that peninsula uh, and, and the roads going through it are pretty, pretty tight. Uh, this decision risked both corps being destroyed in detail. The German 7th Army recognized what was occurring and rapidly oriented on 3rd Army's exposed flank. Upon arriving in France in July at Patton's direction, 3rd Army had placed a significant premium on security to conceal its presence, particularly radio security. When 3rd Army went to operation on 1 August, it lifted this radio silence, uh, but restrictions, uh, but the emphasis on denying enemy insight to 3rd Army's operations remained. Thus, while the operation entailed risk, 3rd Army possessed an initial advantage. Even unopposed and undetected, pushing so many elements through such small straw risk delays, and each delay provided the Germans decision-making cycle an opportunity to catch up. Furthermore, elements passing through the corridor needed to emerge as combined arms formations ready to continue the exploitation. General Omar Bradley noted that this movement was, quote, flat and possible, but out of the other end of the straw came divisions intact, ready to fight. It is highly likely that the AIS provided Patton with a superior situational awareness and assured communications he needed to manage this, quote, impossible movement and maintain the initiative. By 5 August, 3rd Army's aggressive maneuver had disorganized the German forces across 3rd Army's area of operations. By itself, 3rd Army was presenting the Germans with multiple dilemmas, threatening to seize Brittany with it threatening Brittany with isolation, the envelopment of forces in Normandy, and the seizure of Paris, and a drive to the unprotected border. Uh, slide, please. Particularly characteristic of Patton's operations during August was his continued involvement in military deception to achieve economy of force. In the first days of August, 3rd Army took part in Tactical Operation B, a military deception operation to convince the Germans that the main Allied advance was towards Brittany in the West not towards the east. While Tactical Operation B was a Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force plan rather than a Third Army plan, Patton's continued involvement in military deception operations throughout 1944 is noteworthy and demonstrates that Patton saw the utility of deception as a way to balance that, uh, to, to achieve that economy of force. Patton's information advantage approach was remarkably effective in the first days of August. Communication security, the continued deception regarding Patton's fictional 1st U.S. Army Group, 3rd Army's superior situational awareness, and adequate intelligence combined with the speed of advance through the Avranche Corridor left the Germans at a substantial information disadvantage. Oberbefehl's Haba, or OB West, was almost entirely uh, unaware of 3rd Army's activities and exactly how large a force Patton had moved through the corridor. The shock of 3rd Army's rapid advance and uncertainty regarding its reach further impacted German morale. Yet to this point, 3rd Army was not well and truly inside the German decision-making cycle. Ultra promised to make the difference here. On the night of 6 August, Major Melvin Helfers, the 3rd Army Special Intelligence Officer, provided Patton with ultra intercepts from the first week of August, indicating that Hitler had ordered German forces in Normandy to seize Mortain, 
uh, cut the one American supply route from Normandy into northern France at Avranche and destroy all Allied forces, including Third Army, south of the Mortain of Roche's area, which is kind of at the very tip of the Cotonet Peninsula that you see uh, at the top of, uh, of the screen to the left. Um, Patton initially believed the veracity of Helfer's ultra information, but assessed that what was described was a bluff to cover a more significant withdrawal. Nevertheless, in response to the warning, Patton halted three divisions near, near St. Hilaire, where they, were, where they could contain a German breakout toward Avranche if the attack materialized. Patton's information advantage enabled him to assess German intent, anticipate subsequent decisions, and place forces where they would be in the position to act on the enemy. On 7 August, Field Marshal Gunther von Kluge launched a counterattack with those three, with three Panzer divisions in the first echelon and an SS Panzer division in the second echelon towards Avranche. This attempt to split Third Army from First Army was just as the Ultra Intercepts had indicated. Armed with the understanding of where von Kluge had massed German armor, Patton directed 15th Corps to proceed southeast along the German flank toward Le Mans. Then, on 9 August, he ordered 15th Corps to change its axis of advance from west to east to attack south to north to capture Alcinon. While the, with the attack towards Avranche defeated by First Army, 15th Corps' hook to the north imperiled German salient near Mortain. Threatened with encirclement on 13 August, the German Panzer Corps began extricating itself from the closing Fillet's pocket. Unfortunately, Bradley denied Third Army permission to extend 15th Corps to Fillet's and complete the encirclement of German 7th Army because he feared that, quote, 15th Corps would be unable to contain the retreat in the 18 stampeding German divisions. Yet the withdrawal forced German elements to abandon their wire and telephone communications and rely primarily on radio communications, providing numerous opportunities to generate tactical signals intelligence, exploit the initial success, and keep the Germans rocking. For example, on 14 August, the 118th near Le Mans began intercepting and decrypting numerous field code transmissions associated with armored formations. These intercepts indicated that an armored unit was attempting to penetrate Third Army's enveloping lines, and the company's direction finders provided the location of that formation. In response, 15th Corps blocked approximately 50 armored vehicles moving southeast from the Forêt de Couve, and over the next day, the 79th Infantry Division destroyed the remaining isolated German armored elements. The strategic intelligence set the conditions for tactical success on the ground, subsequently creating conditions to exploit enemy information systems, resulting in further success. While remaining security conscious, soon Third Army was looking for ways to, ultra, to utilize ultra intelligence even more aggressively than it had ever been intended. Major Warwick Wallace, Helfer's assistant, noted that ultra, quote, often is said to be primarily of strategic value and only useful tactically in a static situation. Perhaps its prime value is strategic, but Patton's use of ultra is in his historic drive across France is, fitting, is a fitting thesis for a tactical epic. Where others may have seen the value of ultra in indications and warnings, Patton saw the potential for ultra to facilitate greater understanding of the, of, of the Germans across their entire operational depth. Instead of simply leveraging Ultra to prepare for German counterattacks or understand the forces directly facing him, he used it to sequence his actions and weight his efforts against German weakness. The awareness provided by Ultra allowed Patton to assume <coughs> risk in guarding his flanks, and Patton himself <coughs> remarked that Ultra, quote, saved him the services of two divisions in Third Army's drive across France towards Germany in August and September. If anything, 12th Army Group constrained Patton in its ability to operationalize Ultra to assume prudent risk and concentrate his forces on objectives. Patton continually engaged Bradley about relieving one of his divisions for responsibility for covering the Army Group's fl flank south along the Loire, noting that, quote, he had studied the black market dope, almost certainly Ultra, uh, intently and could see no hazards there south of the Loire. When asked for feedback on Ultra in early September, Patton and his intelligence officer Koch noted that their only complaint with the Ultra system was that they wanted more information of general significance, not just strategic warning. They saw the value of Ultra lying and how it contributed to their overall visualization of the dynamics across the theater. Because Patton had insight into what the enemy was going to do, he could do it first. Maneuver then facilitated intelligence collection in a virtuous cycle, since the retreating Germans were forced to rely primarily on less secure radio rather than wire communications. 
Because he had a unique insight to enemy intentions, he could effectively assume greater risk with his flanks and strike harder and faster. He also had greater insight to his friendly force situation due to the AIS, and he could prevent the enemy from clawing back insight into the Third Army thanks to the CIS's communication security work. Combined, he continued to generate a distinct information advantage over the enemy, staying inside the German intelligence cycle. Third Army could generate information advantage during the pursuit because it went further than other allied armies by aligning functions and information capabilities in complementary ways that increased efficiency. For instance, unlike other US armies in the European theater of operations, the G2 was responsible for the psychological warfare branch. This branch was responsible for combat propaganda directed at enemy forces and first line consolidation work or information operations directed at civilians. It operated a radio station, distributed friendly propaganda through various means, and monitored enemy propaganda radio. This alignment integrated all types of radio monitoring under the joint control of the G2 and the CIS. Thus, responsibility for the majority of Third Army's capabilities to attack enemy decision-making was consolidated under that same structure. This tight integration of the CIS G2 psychological warfare branch also provided the branch with access to the AIS's tactical information, which the European Theater Board, or their, AA, their after action review after the war, cited as critical to the success of psychological operations. To increase efficiency and the speed of execution, Third Army went further than other armies in the European Theater and placed the Third Army Message Control Center also under the responsibility of the, of the SIS. This made the SIS responsible for monitoring which enemy and friendly communication paths were open. In addition, it was responsible for assuring the security and rapid transmittal of priority friendly information while simultaneously exploiting enemy communications. The, the SIS was best postured to attack the enemy decision making process, deny information to and deceive the enemy by coordinating radio countermeasures through the third, for Third Army. With all of these functions integrated under one organization, Patton had the speed of decision making and execution necessary to generate information advantage. The third. The August, 19, in the August pursuit also posed unique command and control uh, problems for Third Army. Technical communication problems abounded, and the crumbling of German resistance after the Mortain Offensive meant that the distance between Third Army units increased greatly. Slide, please. By 15 August, less than two weeks following the initial breakout, Third Army had advanced nearly 400 miles. It was responsible for roughly the north-south frontage from Argentan and Normandy to Orléans on the Loire. 8th Corps in Brittany was reducing fixed positions, elements of 12th Corps blocking the German 7th Army's escape from the Falaise pocket, while 20th Corps and 15th Corps were driving towards the Seine and the German frontier. The distances put significant strain on the AIS's ability to communicate with its far-flung detachments. Thus, in mid-August, 3rd Army faced the challenge of maintaining situational awareness, decision-making superiority, and a battle space that was enlarging by the hour, given limited manpower and unreliable communications technology. Where radio communications were impossible, the AIS ran message center, ran motorcycle messengers, and it also maintained advanced signal centers that relayed messages by courier. In addition to passing information up to headquarters, it also ensured lateral and downward communications and situational awareness. Slide, please. These efforts turned the, uh, the AIS and its focus on liaison made it an information hunter rather than a passive information gatherer and allowed Patton to direct the search for information at lower levels. Its efforts to extend Third Army's operational reach pre prevented Third Army for from culminating in central France in mid-August. By 29 August, though, uh, Third Army's ga gasoline shortage had become acute and the advance effectively stalled until, until 3 September. Third Army was now only 70 miles from the German border, but this reduction in tempo had, had progressively robbed it of, its, of the initiative. Without the sustained pressure, the German decision-making cycle began to catch up. And by the time the army began to resume its operations on 5 September, they faced an enemy over which they had substantially less of an information advantage. Slide, please. So, in conclusion, uh, Third Army's success during the August pursuit can be explained by the effective employment of purpose-built information forces and Patton's unique information advantage approach. The AIS and SIS served as an integrated information advantage enterprise, enhancing friendly decision-making and protecting friendly information while attacking enemy decision-making and disrupting the enemy's use of information. Third Army employed the system to the fullest as part of Patton's innovative competitive approach to information and decision-making.
Slide, please. Third Army's information forces were military effective because they integrated information capabilities within information forces while ensuring operational concepts were consistent with available technology. The CIS was responsible for the bulk of mission protecting friendly information systems and processes. By placing the message control center under the CIS, Third Army empowered the CIS not only with responsibility for physical encoding or encryption of information, but the entire process of securing and delivering information to enable rapid and assured decision making. With the psychological operations branch integrated into the G2, G3 structure, Third Army also possessed integrated processes for attacking and for enemy decision making process. The AIS, for its part, focused on actively hunting information that could drive rapid decision making. Along with the CIS and AIS, assured systems and processes for better, they better, they ensured better systems uh, for decision making. While the AIS ensured Third Army's friendly situational understanding, the CIS ensured information was secure from the enemy. Together, this helped the Third Army keep the enemy rocking and unable to get his balance. Psychological operations uh, and aggressive pursuit allowed Third Army to exploit this success and degrade German morale. The continued use of maneuver to generate opportunities and exploit information it, it represents another less formal integration of capabilities. The insight provided by Ultra allowed Patton to achieve economy of force and balance risk while maintaining his operational tempo. Aggressive maneuver combined with military deception attacked German cognitive processes, resulting in their generally poor ability to mass combat power at points where they could have halted Third Army. These information disadvantages compounded themselves. As the Germans continued to retreat, they lost control of crypto cryptographic materials and were forced to abandon their secure wire communications and rely on less secure and reliable radio communications. This made their information systems and decision-making processes progressively more vulnerable to compromise and further disruption. Therefore, aggressive offense in the physical domain op opened access into enemy communications that would otherwise be inaccessible given the limitations of available intelligence tech collection technology. Third Army also excelled because Patton ensured that the information advantage approach was consistent with available technology. His experience showed the value of the human element in a communications degraded, uh, intimately connected or low bandwidth environment. Understanding Patton's information requirements and possessing a streamlined method for acquiring and relaying information, the AIS kept the commander updated with relevant and timely information. Without the AIS and messenger services, the Third Army would have struggled to acquire information necessary to make timely decisions or lost confidence in its information and the integrity of its decision making processes. Therefore, throughout August, Third Army effectively generated information advantage, enabling dramatic operational level success. Instead of breaking through in Normandy, Third Army broke out, disintegrating German defenses and continually outpacing German attempts to establish new lines. Patton's competitive approach to information and Third Army's dedicated information forces contributed significantly to battlefield success during the August pursuit. His unique information forces and information approach allowed Third Army to anticipate decisions, retain the initiative, manage risk, and extend operational reach. A true icon of innovation. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure speaking to you today. Excellent. Thank you, Major French. A uh, lot of good lessons there that uh, sort of epitomize the applied history uh, uh, philosophy that we adopt here at the center. So thank you. Um, so next uh, we will hear from Dr. Hatch. Over to you, Dave. <clears throat> thank you, John. Thank you, Major French. Uh, that was uh, an excellent presentation. I really learned a lot. I'd like to talk about warfare in the other theater of uh, major theater of war uh, during World War II in the Pacific. Uh, I'm using the battle for Iwo Jima as an example, and uh, during my talk, I will be uh, talking about uh, sometimes the fog of war, but I won't be talking about the horror of war. If you've uh, joined to learn about support to the uh, really dreadful and uh, awful situation of the Marines ashore in Iwo Jima, um, there's still time to get to another session and maybe hear Gabe Marshall's uh, uh, excellent presentation on uh, remote collection. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a kind of SIGINT collection that uh, is largely overlooked uh, as we study it. In fact, uh, 
Next slide, please. Generally, when we mention Ultra or World War II SIGINT, the first image that comes to mind to those who uh, know the war uh, is Ultra, which is the strategic SIGINT, largely uh, the product of uh, Britain's Bletchley Park, the US Army's uh, uh, Signal and, uh, Intelligence Service um, from Arlington, Virginia, and the, uh, the Navy's uh, uh, OP-20G. And no question about it, these were uh, unparalleled uh, supports to decision making, giving commanders information that uh, was a quality, depth, uh, and amount that none had uh, ever had before, at least in uh, American warfare. But there was a second level of signals intelligence. Next slide, please. And that was tactical SIGINT. Major French has already uh, talked about this uh, somewhat, but most uh, major commands, in addition uh, to provide, uh, getting uh, ultra at the senior levels, um, would have uh, collection analysis and uh, distribution units near the front lines, traveling with the uh, uh, troops as they advance and providing uh, knowledge of uh, immediate support to the frontline commanders. Uh, but even here, there's sometimes a, a bit uh, a, of a uh, different curve in how we understand it. Most of the memoirs of this sort of uh, activity have been written by uh, veterans of the army effort in Europe. And we tend to forget that it went on in the army and other theaters of war. And we tend to forget that the US Navy also practiced tactical intelligence. Uh, next slide, please. The Navy had experience uh, in tactical SIGINT uh, in the Mediterranean during uh, the early operations in North Africa and uh, Sicily and, and Italy, and <clears throat> also developed experience in tactical intelligence uh, in the Pacific, not very long after Pearl Harbor. Um, after the Japanese surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, the US Navy was not yet in a uh, situation where it could conduct major operations and in fact was supposed to be going on the defensive. But just to show the Japanese we weren't out of the war, uh, the U.S. Navy in the Pacific launched uh, nuisance raids against Japanese-held islands, uh, essentially uh, bombing missions uh, from aircraft carriers. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Um, from these nuisance raids, uh, the first one I think being conducted by Admiral Halsey, uh, the raids were supported by radio intelligence units. Their purpose was force protection. That is, tip off the commander of the task force or the commanders of subordinate units in the task force about Japanese intentions and actions. Uh, did the uh, Japanese detect the presence of the American Naval Task Force? was uh, were the Japanese launching aircraft uh, to uh, attack us? Uh, were there uh, picket ships that were reporting on uh, the presence of Americans and preparing to take action? Next slide, please. From these early raids, uh, each task force would have at least one radio intelligence unit aboard. The first one, the pioneer in this, was uh, Lieutenant Gilvin Slonim, a person I think who has not yet uh, been recognized for uh, the contributions he made to this. He pioneered the concepts of providing direct support to the task force commanders. Uh, also important in the early days was uh, Tex Beard, who uh, uh, was probably the second one uh, to lead such a detachment. The Navy practice became 
keep the commander of the radio intelligence unit with the same operational commander. So they would get used to each other. The SIGINT officer would learn uh, what that particular commander wanted to know in addition to the basics, would learn uh, how to present it to him. The uh, commander would learn how the SIGINT detachment worked, what he was able to get from it, uh, what he was uh, legitimately able to uh, ask for from that uh, detachment. And uh, the, the two uh, commanders would develop sort of a common vocabulary, a, a common concept of how all this would, would work out. Uh, these commanders would have uh, instant access to the, uh, the top deck uh, where the decisions were made. Uh, and would uh, provide information at all hours of the day uh, at any time. Uh, their presence was uh, always appreciated. Uh, next slide, please. This is the plan of action for American forces in the Pacific. Uh, next slide. The American forces captured um, uh, positions in the Solomon Islands, particularly at Guadalcanal. Guadalcanal was important because it had an airfield uh, from which further operations could be launched. The Japanese had fortified a buffer uh, zone, a group of islands uh, all the way north in the Pacific uh, to keep the Americans away from their home islands. Next slide. Then the Gilberts capture airfields. The, the US Navy would bypass islands even though they were enemy strongholds, uh, but they were not important. They did not support further operations and in fact would become worthless to the Japanese as um, American forces outflanked them and isolated them. Next slide. The Marshall Islands, next. The Marianas and then next. Finally, the Bonin Islands, the principal uh, one of which was um, Iwo Jima. Next slide. And again. Thank you. Iwo Jima was uh, one of the last barrier islands in this buffer zone the Japanese had uh, erected uh, uh, on a, these chains of islands. It uh, was the second last stop before the home islands themselves. From Iwo Jima, aircraft could easily reach the home islands and take the bombing campaign uh, to the uh, Japanese uh, homeland itself. Next slide. Iwo Jima was uh, a heavily fortified island the Japanese had had control of it uh, since the 1920s. Uh, it was heavily fortified. Uh, it was going to be a, a very tough fight uh, for any attackers. Next slide. It is what one uh, Marine called it, a sulfurous little hellhole. Uh, but we are not uh, concerned with the, uh, the fight ashore. It was terrible. Uh, I can only have sympathy with uh, those who had to uh, participate in that fight, but we're going to talk about uh, the next slide, which is the operations of SIGINT radio intelligence detachments to support the supporting ships in the attack on Iwo Jima. There were uh, a number of aircraft carriers that would launch planes in support of uh, the operations ashore, conduct bombing raids, so on. The Yorktown, with which we'll be concerned, was one of the, I think, one of the last to arrive in the theater of war. Uh, its mission was to uh, swing outward, bomb Tokyo, and then uh, join the, uh, the landing force uh, at uh, the Bonin Islands. Next, uh, next slide. 
This is the radio room on a carrier. Uh, the radio intelligence unit would have looked pretty much like this, I think, except for uh, size. Uh, the radio room itself would have uh, probably about twice as many people at least on duty at any one time as the uh, radio intelligence unit. But you can see the same tight spaces, uh, the same clutter of equipment, uh, and uh, uh, the utilization of virtually all the space. Uh, next slide, please. A radio intelligence unit um, would have uh, on duty at any one time a commander and four eavesdroppers, four radio men. Uh, they would operate as a unit. Uh, while they were billeted with the ship's crew, they were warned not to make any close friends and to deflect any inquiries about what they were really doing. They were just to say they were radio men and hope that that uh, cut off any further conversations. The uh, detachment commander was warned that he should not make many friends among the uh, uh, operational crew of the uh, uh, Yorktown, but because he was a relatively junior officer, he had to make some friends in key places. He had to have a, uh, a few officers on the uh, uh, flag officer's staff who could stand up for the radio intelligence unit uh, among subordinate officers who might want to throw their weight around against this rogue unit. Next slide, please. The commander on the Yorktown of the radio intelligence unit was Lieutenant Wilfred Kluss. Uh, he was a recent Harvard graduate. Uh, he had joined the Navy in uh, 1943 and sent immediately to a year's schooling at a school for Japanese linguists the Navy had uh, set up at Boulder, Colorado. Uh, he was uh, after uh, language training, trained in uh, radio procedures, uh, given uh, a lot of different kinds of exposure to the things he would need to know uh, about how our carrier operations uh, go, uh, so he would know what kinds of information were needed. And he was also uh, schooled on how the Japanese Navy operated. Next slide, please. And again, um, Kluss was from Iowa. Uh, he had uh, uh, just passed his uh, uh, 21st birthday uh, when he enlisted or when he uh, took his commission. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Um, he, he was uh, sent to this series of schools. He was uh, he, he, he served on the uh, commander in chief in the Pacific's uh, staff uh, and eventually would uh, fill other jobs that took advantage of his language ability. Next slide, please. Every commander of a radio intelligence unit kept a diary. It was a day to day and then minute by minute accounting of what was happening in the radio intelligence unit. Uh, was a log of all intercept that had any meaning. It was a log of all activities or personnel actions that might affect the operations of the uh, intelligence unit. Uh, I came across the log that Lieutenant Kluss kept at Iwo Jima a couple of years ago in the uh, U.S. National Archives, uh, and uh, it was a revelation to me. I, I principally had been uh, an analyst of uh, Army operations, but I was very much taken with the uh, intense, detailed, and personal view that this diary provided of the uh, uh, service the radio intelligence unit rendered at uh, Iwo Jima. Next slide, please. I actually found two diaries, one from the Battle of Iwo Jima, one from the Battle of Kwajalein. Uh, we are talking today about Iwo Jima because 
Lieutenant Plus had the better handwriting and it was easier to follow uh, his entries in the uh, in the logbook. Uh, the logbook is very much concerned with their business. It has no information about what was going on ashore at Iwo Jima. It had only occasional references to what the radio intelligence units on other uh, 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 aircraft carriers in the task force might be doing. Next slide. Okay. What did uh, what did this radio unit provide if it didn't talk about the combat ashore? Next slide, please. Well, the key question that the commander wanted to know first was, do the Japanese know we're here? Uh, uh, so this detachment is listening for any Japanese radio communications uh, that might reveal that the Japanese know the Yorktown is in their territory. And in the case of uh, Iwo Jima, Lieutenant Kluss was able to assure uh, his commander, uh, Admiral Radford, that uh, the Japanese did not detect the presence of the Yorktown until aircraft from the Yorktown started uh, bombing them. So this was uh, very important information. Uh, the Admiral was able to base decisions about how many airplanes to launch and so on, uh, and the kinds of force protection he needed based on this uh, fact that the, the Japanese were not prepared to deal with him. Next. Okay, as the battle unfolded, the radio unit was to listen for and report any indication that the Japanese uh, might be launching aircraft or ships uh, bo or boats uh, that could threaten the Yorktown. And once again, he was able to assure uh, the commander, uh, the admiral, that nothing of this kind had been detected. Next slide. Very important part of the mission was to inform his admiral where Japanese plan, uh, planes landed after they uh, flew missions, uh, as they were attacking the uh, the overall American task force, once they had uh, uh, launched their uh, ordnance, were returning to base. What base were they returning to? The admiral needed to know where the Japanese air strength was located, uh, and. Uh, Lieutenant Kluss and his uh, radio intelligence uh, unit were able to provide detailed information on uh, on this subject uh, every day and sometimes hour by hour. Next slide, please. In addition to communications from the island of Iwo Jima itself, uh, Lieutenant Kluss's detachment was able to intercept communications from uh, many uh, air bases in the Japanese home islands. Iwo Jima is not that far from uh, the three main uh, Japanese islands. Uh, and uh, as uh, uh, Kyoto or uh, Yokohama or other large bases would go on alert, uh, the radio intelligence detachment would inform their admiral that this had happened. No one knew quite what it meant. Was it that the Japanese were anticipating another American attack there, or were they getting ready to launch their own aircraft for their offensive operations? This was important, uh, so uh, it was reported on an hourly basis often. Next slide. And the Japanese had a string of very small ships, picket ships they were known as, uh, that would both watch for the approach of American ships and the approach of American aircraft. So the radio intelligence detachment would report about the communications from these picket boats that would help locate where they were so American missions could avoid detection as they flew into uh, uh, Iwo Jima or occasionally would go uh, bomb the uh, mainland of uh, or the main Japanese islands. Next slide, please. This is not as easy as it sounds. All 
militaries have their own specialized vocabulary, their slang. Um, most militaries use uh, uh, a dictionary full of acronyms and abbreviations and uh, brevity codes uh, to convey a lot of information with uh, uh, just a uh, code word or two. The eavesdroppers in the radio intelligence unit had to know what these were. If uh, something uh, was said, uh, 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 a stutter group of syllables, for example, what did it mean? Uh, and sometimes it was only used once, so they had to be on the alert uh, and interpret it uh, uh, for what it meant. Uh, this was, they had reference materials, of course, but in combat, there's never any time to use them. Uh, these were specialists in uh, a variety of Japanese language, uh, even though uh, probably none of them could have gone on to the Ginza in Tokyo and ordered a cup of coffee. Uh, they were able to grasp and understand and report on this kind of specialized use of Japanese. Next slide, please. They also had to be an expert in uh, geography. Uh, these communications would uh, be from units spread all around that area of the Pacific, often very small and obscure islands where there was just a very small airfield, for example, uh, or a, a very small base uh, for picket boats. Uh, they had to be able to identify, recognize, and uh, report on the specific areas, including very uh, small uh, Next slide, please. Already mentioned that um, in this case, the radio intelligence unit uh, actually had good news for the, um, the admiral in charge of the uh, Yorktown. Uh, next slide, please. Some of the information from the radio intelligence unit was forwarded on uh, to other elements of the task force and sometimes forwarded uh, to a, a higher Navy echelon headquarters. It was uh, used uh, for targeting subs. Uh, next slide, please. One very interesting incident, um, the radio intelligence unit reported uh, that American planes had uh, shot up uh, one of the picket ships and the picket ship broadcast a farewell. We're making a charge. All hands are determined to die an honorable death. Banzai for his majesty, the emperor. Next slide, please. Um, Kless also served as uh, an interpreter for one prisoner. Next slide, please. Finally, the operation uh, ended. The Navy uh, was withdrawing some of the task forces. Uh, uh, Lieutenant Kless took note of this. Next slide, please. And uh, two very items, uh, great items on the second page. Uh, next slide. Nothing of interest. I think uh, everybody was uh, entirely relieved uh, to hear that. Um, next slide. And they were underway back to base where they could get rest, recuperation, and, uh, and ice cream. Uh, next uh, slide. So uh, this is not the kind of ultra that uh, makes the earth-shaking uh, difference that we've heard in many of the World War II stories. Uh, it's an obscure corner of signals intelligence activities in the wartime, but it's uh, even if overlooked, it was an absolutely essential one in protecting our force uh, from uh, enemy actions. And um, for my further remarks, last slide, I have nothing else of interest either, so I'll turn it back to John. 
Thanks, Dave. That uh, really was fascinating, and I, I do appreciate how you and Spencer have really touched on, uh, uh, as you as you said multiple times, a forgotten corner of, of signals intelligence history. So to take it in a slightly different direction, but also equally uh, fascinating, I'll turn it over now to uh, Dr. Pardini, sir. Sir, don't forget to un please unmute and start again. Thank you. Sorry, sorry. Well, you got you okay. When Leslie Fiedler died in January 2003, the noted British critic Christopher Bigsby wrote in an obituary for the Guardian newspaper that, quote, Fiedler was one of those Jewish critics who lay a retrospective claim to classic American literature, reinventing it in the process, end quote. Slate magazine and former New York Times literary editor Sam Tanninghouse wrote that the country lost its greatest literary critic. When he got off the train in Boulder, age 26, to attend the Navy Japanese language school, however, Leslie Aaron Fiedler was an unknown assistant professor of English at the Montana State University in Missoula. With him were his pregnant wife, Margaret Shipley, and their four-year-old son, Kurt. The family will welcome a new member, Eric, into the world about a month after their arrival in the Western State in January 1943. Slide, please. The couple had met at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where Fiddler, native, a native of Newark, New Jersey, had gone to pursue his PhD in English, focusing on Renaissance literature, after getting an undergraduate degree at NYU Heights in the Bronx. Margaret, a native of Cleveland, had obtained her bachelor's degree in psychology. The Fiddlers, like other handful of students whose spouses, live off campus near the school. Upon being commissioned in May 1944, Fiddler was assigned to the Intelligence Center Pacific Ocean, Ocean Area in Honolulu, the admiral name is the commander-in-chief in the Pacific, headed. According to historian Roger Dingman, it was the most effective intelligence center for the war against Japan. The center did not allow wives to live with their husbands. Consequently, after post-graduation, brief return to the East Coast in Newark, where Fiddler's parents lived and Margaret decided to stay with the boys before moving to Mahopak, New Jersey, New York with the kids. Leslie headed west to Hawaii via San Francisco, where he spent about two weeks waiting for his transfer papers and undertaking some medical swimming and warfare tests. Fiddler was staying in Honolulu from June 1st, 1944 until the beginning of February 1945, when he volunteered for a series of missions in the Pacific that culminated at Iwo Jima. In the tiny Pacific island, he interrogated Japanese POWs aboard the USS Auburn, watched one of the greatest slaughter in humans in recorded history, and witnessed the raising of the flag on Mount Suribachi, the latter event the subject of his second to last published essay. He returned to Honolulu at the beginning of April, a few days after Iwo Jima was finally won. He remained in Hawaii until July, when he was transferred to Guam, the Pacific Island U.S. forces and reconquered from the Japanese the previous August, supposedly waiting to be part of the invasion of Japan. The invasion, of course, never happened. Simply and somewhat cruelly, but factually put it, Fiddler was one of the many, many beneficiaries of the two atomic bombs dropped on Japan. Likely, those bonds prolonged his life. Certainly, they extended his service in the Pacific. In early September, in fact, the war officially over, Fiddler was shipped to Tianjin in northern China, attached the Marine 5th Division, a unit of the 3rd Amphibious Corps, to help repatriate more than half a million Japanese POWs. In early December, after a rather adventurous trip, he landed for one last time the year in Honolulu, which he left to finally return home the day after Christmas. As soon as the couple left Boulder, they started the daily correspondence. Except for two very brief letters of Margaret and Rolf Fiedler, what is left of the epistolary are her husband's letters, which, unfortunately, give us, if not an entirely one-sided view of the war experience, certainly an amputated one in some respect. For many years, Fiedler kept the letters in the attic of his big house in Buffalo, New York. He had moved to Western New York in the early 1960s after more than 20 years in Montana to teach at one of the four main campuses of the SUNY system, where he would spend the rest of his academic career. Unfortunately, in 1995, a fire burned down a good part of his home, and with it, a good chunk of the handwritten letters, mostly from the early part of 1945. A few others were badly burned and are now readable except for a few paragraphs. 
unfortunately, the, the vast majority, 423 to be precise, remain intact. Peter wrote them on a stationary paper with ink pens from the various locations where he found himself. Because of his special military status and the kind of work he was involved in, all the letters until September 5, 1945 had to pass the Navy's censorship, as the stamp on their envelopes indicates. Furthermore, all the language officers had to take an oath of secrecy that would bind them for the rest of their life, and which, to their credit, and the military is a fine understanding of human psychology the officers upheld. In a way, censorship is what dictates and frames the content of the letters and fuel the aforementioned discovering transformation, as it forced Fiedler to talk about anything except what he was actually doing for eight hours a day, the essential reason why he was in the war. In a very concrete sense, then, the content of the letters is the result of his war experience by way of negation. To put it differently, the letters are an essential modern experience, one that forced the young literary, literary humanist to address, at least until the official end of the conflict, primarily what he was not doing for the war. And it is so in a geographical, cultural, historical, political, as well as at the level of basic everyday life negotiations, human context that the war determined in every aspect. It is one thing re reading Moby Dick in the comfort of one's home or the library. It is a whole different thing reading in the middle of the Pacific Ocean aboard the USS Coleman on the way to China for a military mission against a known white enemy. enemy. Additionally, somebody who was used to address large classrooms predominantly full of young white boys at a public university in the west of the United States had an audience of one, a woman. Margaret was younger than he was by a couple of years. She was politically savvy and unlike most women at the time, formally educated. Her life experience included an acquaintance with the environment of Jewish underworld of Cleveland. And of course, she was already a wife and a mother of two boys. This is the context of these letters and the experiences they chronicle. Whatever Fiedler describes, comments, observes, and criticizes, he relates it to a woman who lives in a different life in a different world, geographically as well as factually. It is something of which is acutely aware and that triggers his writing. If an epistolary is a form of one psyche opening by way of written communication to another person, however private his opening may be, here this is twice the case. The writer, in fact, is forced to share himself a context and a set of peoples whose life the war determines are with very limited life experience. Moreover, his life experience had very little in common with the world and often the people who inhabited it who were entirely new to him and his fellow language officers. No wonder then, in his 1969 autobiographical book being busted, Fiedler recalls how before the war he had never seen the Pacific Ocean in his life. The limited life experience is on display in various passages and often a tone that is not immune to ethnic prejudice, a genuine patriarchal attitude that occasionally borders on sexism, not uncommon in a Jewish man who grew up in 1920s and 30s America, and a rigidity in established gender role. Certainly, I do not especially reading, I do not especially enjoy reading, quote, the walk in civilian clothes, end quote. Yet, I'm mindful this is early 1940 United States, the time of Sinatra film in the house I live in, when Americans hated the Japanese as much as they hated Hitler, and for good reasons. It was a time when the kind of language was common parlance as the structure of thoughts reflective of established economic structures too, were prevalent in most quarters across ethnic and racial lines. To an extent, Fiedler acknowledges at a personal and cultural level at least, at least twice in the, in the letters. First on August 1st, 1944, when he describes an unplanned visit to a church he walked by in Honolulu. He writes to Margaret, quote, of my sins, my inadequacy, my illiteracy of self-examination locked into me, laced by my customary habits of recent of reticence and self-deceit. Marianism in all this form is alien to me. I cannot comprehend it." End quote. The second time on November 24, 1944, when he asked Margaret to give the kids, quote, an extra show of affection that I perhaps would have been too busy or too possessed by masculinity to expand, end quote. It is also salutary to might be mindful that as a Jew, Fiedler himself experienced his fair share of prejudice and discrimination, including in the military, where his whiteness only pays so much. 
It is no coincidence that colleagues he bonded and shared private spaces with are almost invariably Jewish as well. On June 5, 1944, 45, for example, he writes Margaret, quote, my other disturbing experience in the office today was a newspaper clip that somebody had carried to work with him. His topography looked like the New York Times, and he told the 2000 released French prisoners who had been held in Nazi POW camps, some of them for as long as years. On the return to Paris, they rioted in the public streets, breaking into a raiding clothing stores, and crying, of all things in the world, death to the Jews, down with the Jews. The astounding success of Nazi propaganda, the basic hang hunger for its attitudes, that seems to lie in wait at the heart, at the heart's dark core, the press is one." End quote. A little over three months later, on September 1945, in Guam, he laments that he is, able, he is able to know the Jewish calendar with its festivities solely because a Jewish colleague has arrived from the States and has confirmed his guesses. Quote, I learned from him that Rosh Hashanah had been the 7th and the 8th of this month, with Yom Kippur to count to the 17th. I had a vague, vague feeling of the present of the high holidays, but have been unable to pin down the exact date." End quote. Likewise, while Christian services were offered on any ship he sailed on, no such a thing was available to Jewish soldiers. And when he and a fellow Jew attempt to cross the racial line, they were not reciprocated. Quite the contrary, as soon as they approached the black sailors and other GIs to share some music on a jukebox in an alley in Honolulu, the latter live because they are convinced that interracial spaces are forbidden or it's preferable to avoid them. Or perhaps, given our racial history and possibly their own personal experience, because they fear sharing spaces with whites, especially Navy officers. One must be mindful of the fact that there is no contradiction holding two opposite ideas in mind at once. One can read the letters exactly in this perspective and realize how, as Fidel proceeds with the letters, and perhaps more important, as he gets physically outside of the United States and its inwardly bent war environment, as he moves forward in time and outward in space, so do his comments on and evaluations of people and context. He lays behind his biases and it increasingly opens up toward the unknown and the other, to the point that after a couple of weeks in China, he, write to Margaret, he writes to Margaret that he regrets saying, quote, evil things about the Chinese, end quote, and that the Japanese are not, quote, symbolic enemies, end quote. Likewise, in the absence of Western faces, he realizes, quote, the immense solitude of being white and alien, yet this makes all clearer in the end, the ineffable line that binds us all human and forces him to bow into, bow into my obligation to love these people, end quote. Such a statement amounts to nothing short of an ongoing self-liberation that the physical and cultural encounter with, it, with and the recognition of the enemy fueled. This self-liberation rests on the two foundational pillars. The first is his humanistic background, which especially in the first few months he confronts critically in the letters, writing about Grand Green, W.H. Holden, Greek tragedy, Danish philosopher Sori Kierkegaard, Moby Dick, Milton, T.S. Eliot, Aldous Huxley, Walt Whitman, obscure 16th century poet and poetic movements, modern American dance, 17th century harpsichord harp players, contemporary popular literature, jazz bands, and blues singers. I would contend that because he's writing to a woman from outside the United States, in what is essentially an American colony, the young scholar and teacher who is constantly exposed to racism at home and abroad, eventually comes to turn with certain strains of his own background and attitudes. The same humanistic knowledge is what in China triggers interest in the woodprints of the greater Japanese artist Utamaru, as well as in a booklet titled How the Red Army Fights, which becomes the object of a ferocious close reading turning to a class-based critique of Stalinism. The second pillar of Fidel's trajectory is his committed belief in democracy. Which is, one, which is one and the same with his humanism, this flip side of the same coin. His is a genuine way of understanding democracy, one, I would say, very American in the best sense of the word. It is a democracy rooted in and emanating from the everyday life of the demos where it belongs. Democracy for Fiddler a guiding principle that while he recognizes the unicity of the American experience in the Western world does not rhyme with American exceptionalism. In a while, he learns to realize that he's living among what he calls a conquered people. 
His anti-Stalinism is everywhere in the letters, well before it would become a central issue in the political and cultural debate in the 1950s. In China, he writes to Margaret that war trials, if they had to be had, should include the Americans, the position that then is today with earning the ire, if not the hatred, of the majority's fellow Americans, especially those who never fought, let alone volunteer in a war, to defend at least some semblance of democracy and freedom. He is against the persecution of, Jap of the Japanese, the enemy who attacked Pearl Harbor, and almost successfully dropped bombs on the USS Auburn while he was aboard it at Iwo Jima. He condemns the Chinese communists who use poverty as a tool for power with no respect for human dignity. At the same time, he sees in the Chinese theater an analogy with the minstrel show. Back in Honolulu, after leaving China, he shows class solidarity with bus drivers. He even aligns himself as a Jew with a Levantine heritage with the Muslims and the Blacks, without overlooking his privileged status as a U.S. naval officer and his advantageous whiteness. Even his gender rigidity gives way to his disgust and resentment for the abusive sexism of American officers in China. In other words, that the core of the letters transpire with one of his former students, James Cox called Fiddler's democratic freedom that lies at the heart of his identity as an intellectual and an American also as a result of his experience in the war. This democratic freedom allows him to resist his own tendency to opinionate or on or judge people. They allow him to resist what are at times strong biases and impulses while he is living separated from his family, forced to negotiate the difficulties of sharing quarters with younger men much younger than in terms than he in terms of life experience, often hailing from solid middle class or upper class family unlike his. All of this is a witness is important to do otherwise violence of our source, death, and experiences bouts of, the, bouts of depression, coupled with, understandably, an ever increasing longing for returning home to his family, as if the war with Satkan did not matter at all. There is nothing especially arbitrary or surprising about this desire, which was widespread among all troops. Anybody who has ever worn a military uniform knows that nobody wants to avoid wars as much as soldiers, because they are the ones who fight and die in them, after all. For the same reason, nobody wants to end wars quicker than the soldiers, so they hopefully can go home. Only in Hollywood, the war is turned into an opportunity for individual heroism. It is not um, unsurprising if Fieder chronicles the Navy's propaganda use of Hollywood war movies, war movies which, in which he turns into film and social criticism. The war, the war that his letters describe instead makes clear the tragedy of war is, in any sense, with no exception whatsoever. By the same token, this is what made him realize the necessity of the war and the useful, usefulness of his work as a cryptologist and translator of Japanese once face to face with the war itself. The letters achieved this realis realization inherently by way of reflecting on and projecting the concrete materiality of the war and life under and at war, both psychological and factual, existential and bodily, which might as well their essential value for us today. When Fiddler arrives in China, he writes that he finally understood the meaning of victory. When a local, a Russian, a Russian woman, shake his hand, quote, there was a little blonde Russian woman next to me. Suddenly she was crying with little animal sobs. Eight years, she said over and over, I'm happy. A few minutes later, she turned to me shyly and said, let me shake your hand. I was for the first time touched has some real sense of the meaning of victory beyond the provocation to us, and the simple relief of being able to talk of the end, end quote. Instead, in front of a bunch of intelligent officer colleagues admiring the dead bodies of the enemy in a photograph, or the officer laughing at a group of black sailor playing baseball, he feels a loss with himself and the world he inhabits. In one of the crudest letters, he comments how, by doing his duty in Tianjin, most likely he caused the execution of an innocent Japanese and feels like, quote, a Jew in the land of the Gestapo, end quote. In a rather concrete sense, his humanism and his commitment to democracy are well allowed him to survive. They allowed him to go through the war without paying the ultimate price, which of course is not death. 
After all, especially in a world that is even more than it normally is out of one's control, often a question of circumstances, if not luck, and what ultimately war entails. The ultimate prize that Fiddler knew is to hate the enemy. The same person who stated he does not believe in pacifism and volunteered to defeat Nazism. And let me repeat, he's a Jewish man, write to his Jewish wife and son that it is, quote, permitted us to kill the enemies, but not to hate them, to love our hate, to be proud of their love, end quote. Especially because of its context, this is a remarkable line, one that I think his humanism and his belief in democracy make possible. His literary culture and his commitment to what he calls real democracy ultimately protected him from hating the enemy and the other. That is to say, they protected him from hating himself. Even his faith in God, ever present in the letters, attests to this. There is nothing especially theological about his repeated evocation of God, as he clarifies when on August 6, uh, 1944, he writes to Margaret, quote, I've just reread my letters so far and have been wondering if you're alienated ever by my theological vocabulary, my constant invocation of God. It was since I have achieved belief, I'm not sure except that it's not final, not a complete act of faith, not the lip, but these are for me the most successful of metaphors, end quote. Indeed, the war experience related to the letters seems to parallel our search for both the sublime and its identity as a Jew. There can be hardly anything that challenges one faith more than a war, I think, especially one live close enough to witness its horrors, and yet, for the most part, distant enough to barely feel a risk of dying, even more so, I would think, for a Jewish man in World War II. In this regard, it's profitable to note how upon starting his trip from China to Pearl Harbor and eventually Newark, he confesses to Margaret a feeling of guilt, reassesses in a much fairer way the, com the commander with his fellow language officer, slide please, and shows a more sympathetic view of Hawaii. In short, as work has come to an end for Fiedler, he lets the guard down. It seems as if throughout the previous 18 months, he had put a psychological shield to defend his psyche and his identity. No wonder then, and after a few days back in Hawaii, he writes to Margaret he, one more time, a Jew went to church where everyone is equal and nobody's enemy. Quote, I like the warm, humane, godly place, Margaret. Like the absurd instant of the rail when the collection, the Negro, the Philippines, the wave, the shop girl, the improbable blonde sailor surrender to the only democracy that is not a hoax of a mere programmatic item, end quote. A gesture that aligns diversity class and the freedom to believe with democracy. What makes this moment even more notable is the fact that the man who writes lines is conscious of what war did to him one of the lucky men to return from it, how the war transformed him. This is no longer the young man, no matter how intellectually mature and responsibly adult they left, they left for the war. He's a person who feels lost, who recognizes that he is at present time mentally unstable. I have four of your letters with me, upon which I shall fall back when I have given you some decent notion of my status and psychic disequilibrium, he writes on December 10, 1945. Ten days later, he confesses to his wife that he's grown old in the war, that he feels class alienation, that he's on the edge of a nervous breakdown or collapsing. He even experiences a tremor in his hands, the same hands that settle will start to tremor this time to never stop again, decades later when another type of enemy, Parkinson's disease, struck him and eventually forced him to surrender age 86, 60 years after the first tremor. In that moment, in that state, this man is very proud Jew and American who had previously written his beloved wife that, quote, home is a special thing. Home is where one on himself feels, quote, feels the need to be with others in a place where theoretically speaking, everybody is at home. A few days later on Christmas Day, he finally is on the ship to start his trip to his physical home. Aboard the USS Day, when he first, first he chronicles the lack of cheers at the departure, an anticlimactic moment typical of his allegiance to respect the materiality of life, which he always reckoned on a presupposition to understand the human condition in its various contexts, literary as well as social and political. Then he questions the story of the nativity. Rhetorically speaking, he does so in the crudest way. 
even violent way, as he imagines a different graphic, graphic version of it. It's a tough passage to read, to say the least. There is an enraged cynicism in it, even a vulgar meanness. While it might be understandable given the utterance psychological breakdown it was experiencing, I doubt it would be proud of it if he could read it again. Nonetheless, even then, he cannot bring himself to let hate prevail. Instead, he closes by writing his Jewish family clothes, Merry Christmas. I wish I wish only I had been there to read you all the story out of the Bible and perhaps a Renaissance poem. Thank you very much. Yep. Wow, that was uh, fantastic, uh, Dr. Pardini. The closing was especially dramatic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we do have a few questions that have come in uh, for the three of you. So let me start by going back to Major French. Um, you can see one there, I think, but I'll read it to you anyway, uh, from Colonel David King. Oscar Koch is a member of the Military Intelligence Hall of Fame. Was he the greatest G2 of World War II? Loaded question for you, MI officer. Got my mic, got my mic to work again. Sorry about that. Just worry there for a second. Good, and that gave me a second to stall too with the loaded question. Um, I, I think I think you have to put him up there. Uh, I'll dodge a little bit, but uh, I, I have to put him up there near the top. Um, not particularly a, a little bit of a tangent away from the discussion of uh, of the pursuit in August. Uh, fast forwarding a few months, but. Uh, you, you can compare and contrast how Third Army uh, was looking at the situation at the beginning of December 1944 with uh, others in 12th Army Group, um, and you could make a very strong argument uh, that I wouldn't go as far as to say that Koch predicts the, you know, the uh, uh, the German offensive that later gets called the Battle of the Bulge, uh, but he comes, he, he's he's probably closer to the mark than a lot of his peers, so. Uh, I know I dodged the question of who's the greatest, uh, but I would say that, uh, that Colonel Koch definitely belongs near the top, uh, definitely belongs in the MI Hall of Fame, and you know probably was more intuitive than his peers. But I, I would just go ahead and say that you know one thing that's uh, is characteristic of Third Army is is really the the phenomenal pick and shovel workers uh, that. Um, that's Patton called them, the pick and shovel workers who were, were those deputies uh, who made those really intuitive, um, you know, the, the lead, the, the leaders shine. Thanks. Um, yeah, it obviously is somewhat subjective. Dave, I don't know if you have an opinion on the same <clears throat> question uh, based on your study of World War II, Sigan. Uh, yes, uh, I would not, <clears throat> I would not disagree with Major French, but uh, I would hope that we don't forget Kenneth Strong, uh, who uh, essentially educated General Eisenhower in the whole question of intelligence and SIGINT specifically. And of course, in educating General Eisenhower, uh, he is uh, eventually educating President Eisenhower. But there are there are many good ones to choose from. Yeah, that's that's kind of where I, my mind went. Uh, in addition to to uh, General Koch. Um, okay, let me uh, let me jump over uh, for a minute to Dr. Uh, Pardini. Um, he actually did have a question for Major French, but uh, before I before I get to that, let me ask you, Samuel. I did. How did you uh, how did you come to this topic? Uh, what what got you interested in it? Uh, to study it at this level of detail. Please, uh, yeah, there you go. No, you're still still muted, sir. Sorry. Now. There yeah, you go. You should hear me. Sorry about that. Uh, so I was I was Leslie Fear last graduate student in Buffalo, and we really connected and clicked. And like I mentioned in the in the essay, at the end of his life, he had Parkinson's disease, so you know um, he could no longer go to campus. So I started going to his home 
to do work with him because I did independent studies with him. And so, you know, he spent a lot of time after in the early 50s, he spent two years in Italy with a Fulbright scholarship, which is essentially what he opened up his career to become what he became later. So we are really connected. So I became, you know, very close to him and, you know, without going, you know, too many details, you know, at the end, you know, when he died, I was the only known family member who carries coffin. Uh, so after he died, his wife, you know, uh, asked me if, you know, because he had all these uh, letters, 423, from his time in the war, as, you know, um, as I said, in the US Navy as a, a cryptologist. And he said, look, you know, the kids, you know, two had already died. Uh, and they were interested. Nobody does this kind of stuff. One is a doctor, one was a sociologist, one was a nurse. So, you know, he said, do you want it? You know, yeah, I said, well, yeah, I mean, like, you know, you're kidding me. Yeah, you want to play for the Yankees? Yeah, I mean, I'd like to play for the Yankees, right? So, you know, <laughs> you know I mean, and uh, uh, so I got these letters and I started going through, you know, it's 423 and uh, they're handwritten. And uh, I had done a book of, of essays in 2008. They haven't been collected, but, you know, a collective essay of his. They had done very well, got reviewed, you know, in the Los Angeles Times and other places. So, you know, I had already tenure here at Elon, so uh, I didn't need to, you know, my book has been published already. So I had the time to dedicate to a new project. And I said, look, I think there's a lot in this, you know. This is like a unique experience. First of all, as uh, David uh, said, you know, mentioned the Boulder School is a unique experience in, uh, in the history of, you know, 20th century American culture, but also with so the military, because they basically put up, a, you know, a fantastic Japanese school in, in the terminal, like a year, I guess, after Pearl Harbor, you know. And it was one of the few who happened to be selected there. And then, you know, he went to Honolulu and then he, you know, the Pacific Theater, I mean, Iwo Jima, Saipan, Okinawa, and after the war, Tianjin in China, I said, there's a lot, you know, this is an historical document, which I think is worth, you know, putting out publicly if somebody's willing to publish it. And I'm just waiting now. SUNY Press is supposed to do the book, so I'm, I'm waiting for to hearing from them. And and so I started, you know, transcribing them. It took me years because it's 423 handwritten letters, and you know, Sarah put out one page, but he he wrote so little, you know, his calligraphy that at one point, thank God for the censorship, you know. Because the censor told him, either you start writing bigger or they're not going away. They're not going to be sent to you, to your wife and your kids these letters, right? So he started writing letters, you know, bigger, which is what you see. This is bigger, right? Right, right? So it took me years to do it, you know, to transcribe it. And in there, there's everything, you know, that you can possibly imagine, except for the war, actually. Very little, because he couldn't talk about it, right? right? So, you know, I started doing research and of course, you know, I got into, you know, military stuff, I read about all the military bugs and, the, you know, how they were, you know, uh, the, the, the cryptography and so on and so forth. So I did all the reading that traditionally had nothing to do with what I do. I mean, traditionally, usually I don't do that stuff for obvious reason. Right. So now I, you know, I went down to, but, you know, I, I edited the whole thing and it's scaled down to 143 and put in book form. And hopefully as soon as we'll agree to to publish it, you know, they, you they're very. Yeah, I mean, I, sounds, I hope sounds that like a real it, labor of love. It is a labor of love. And I hope when the book comes up, you know, there'll be a chance maybe to do something right. with you guys if you're interested. Great. Well, let me. Uh... Let me switch over to Dave for a minute. Um, speaking of, you know, individual letters and uh, journals in your case, it, in the almost six years I've known you, Dave, and we've talked about a million topics in SIGINT history. I've never heard you talk about these journals. Uh, how did you, I mean, obviously I know they were at NARA, but how did, how did you stumble upon them and 
tell us a little bit about that for a minute. I, <clears throat> yes, thank you. Uh, one of the uh, wonderful things about the NSA material that's been declassified and sent to the National Archives is that it provides a, a wonderful opportunity for serendipity. Uh, the uh, files were sent down there helter skelter and calling for an archive box of documents uh, that have a particular listing that the uh, researcher is interested in. We'll also get him about uh, half a dozen other folders of uh, unrelated topics. And uh, as I was uh, researching uh, another topic, uh, th this, th in fact, the two, one from Iwo Jima, one from Kwajalein, the, the two uh, notebooks were in one folder uh, that I just browsed through. Uh, uh, it, it was just too irresistible once I would finished the material I was actually seeking not to uh, uh, look at the other stuff. I found an awful lot of things for short articles and so on, but uh, also lucked out in finding this uh, material. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen uh, in the research material. So fortunately, I took time to, uh, to scan it. Uh, a little time out of my regular project, but I think time uh, uh, well worth uh, having done. Yeah, no, I obviously concur wholeheartedly. It's uh, it's a niche corner of uh, our business, but it needs it needs more exposure. Um, I, we're we're a minute over time, but I just wanted to get uh, one last question in for Major French because we just we don't get a lot of uh, uniform participation in this thing, and I'm just excited to have you here with us. So, uh, Dr. Pardini had a question there in the chat. I don't know if you had a chance to read it, but it's about the psychological branch. Uh, do you need me to read it to you or can you have you read it? I, I did not read it yet, sir. If you okay, don't mind. Uh, sure. Uh, he asks, I'm interested in the psychological branch of the U.S. Army that you mentioned. Can you speak a little bit about it? How are they structured? Who were the people in it? How are they selected and how they actually operated? So uh, great question, sir. So I uh, so the truth in lending for a second, the uh, the psychological branch was um, was not the, the, the direct focus of, uh, of my research. Most of my research involved the 118th, yeah, yeah. And, but I did come across really interesting um, from the after action reviews at the end of the war. Uh, there's a whole section dedicated to it. And when you peel back the onion, you find that really in 1940, early 1940s up through the end of the war, there's the United States Army lacks um, a real doctrinal framework for how it plans on employing psychological capabilities. Uh, it lacks equipment. Uh, they only start kind of bolting on uh, loudspeakers onto tanks towards uh, towards the end of 1944. Um, they, and all, there's a lot of difference you find in how the different numbered armies uh, end up employing their psychological operations branch uh, across 12th Army Group and across the European Theater of Operations. Um, partly again because they're kind of making some of this up from from scratch as they go so third army went further than others and integrated these folks in with the g2 section a lot of the other army groups employed them as part of kind of a special staff that worked for the chief of staff um, they also had uh, liaisons down at the core level um, who kind of were the primary people who were out there distributing those um, uh, those materials uh, at the tactical edge um, in terms of the personalities, I can't speak to that as much. Uh, but again, it's it's a it's a fascinating time that probably deserves uh, some more research. Uh, uh, given that, again, this is kind of the the obviously propaganda has been around since the beginning of war, um, and even in World War One, you definitely saw people folks using radios and, and whatnot to to spread information. But um, the United States Army is really kind of figuring this out on the fly as they go to a certain extent, at least if, at least as a, at least in a formalized way, they're trying to formalize some of these processes as they go. And you see that reflected uh, in those uh, after action reviews, those uh, European theater boards after. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. I, I, when I was in Afghanistan, I actually ran around theater a lot with the PSYOPers, and uh, it's interesting how that mission has really evolved over over the decades. So yeah, thanks for that. Well, I'm gonna wrap it up then. Uh, thank you gentlemen all for your participation. Um, 
Thank you. Major French, thank your uh, commander for allowing you to do this and uh, encourage him to to uh, let more of, more of you guys and, and women uh, participate uh, with us yeah. in the future. So. That would be nice. So thanks, thank you uh, all three, and we look forward to uh, seeing you back with us uh, hopefully tomorrow. Yeah. Have a good night. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Bye. David. David.